Well, today there's not a single uh, sector of the economy that doesn't rely fundamentally on semiconductors. It's not just high tech like smartphones or PCs. It's all manufactured goods. A new car, for example, will have a, a thousand ships on average inside of it. And the production of semiconductors is far more concentrated than production of oil. Saudi Arabia makes up 10 or 15% of world oil production, but TSMC in Taiwan produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips. So every year, chips get more important to the world economy, and their production gets more and more concentrated in the hands of just a tiny handful of firms. So, Chris, at this point, I, I would be stunningly worried about the ramifications of TSMC and Taiwan in the absolute epicenter of geopolitics and concerns are really obvious for anyone who just looks at a map and looks at what the US and China have been up to in the last 30 years. And yet, your book left a more nuanced picture than that because I'm, I'm less worried because I think you were making the point uh, that actually no one's ever going to control the entire uh, ecosystem as well, whether it's the fabrication whether it's the IP as well. It is a global interconnected system as well. Do I need to be pessimistic about the former premise or actually optimistic the fact that both the Chinese and the Americans and other players as well know that no one power or no one set of powers can control the whole ecosystem? I think you're right that the ecosystem is globally integrated. You just mentioned ARM and applied materials, one in the UK, one in the US, TSMC in Taiwan, uh, uh, chemicals producers in uh, Japan, ASML in the Netherlands, you can't make an advanced chip without uh, using materials, software, intellectual property, machines from a whole suite of different countries. And so, so long as political leaders around the world are focused on economic growth and technological advancement, they'd be crazy to disrupt the semiconductor supply chain. But I think the question is looking at China's economy right now and Xi Jinping's policies in China, whether that's the focus of Beijing or whether, in fact, they're going to focus instead on political goals rather than economic outcomes. Chris, it's uh, Arjun here. I think what Steve was alluding to there was the, really the intricacies of the supply chain in the semiconductor world as well. And one of the interesting things is the way that the U.S. has moved forward on, on sort of two fronts. One, to sort of uh, create uh, partnerships with, with countries it sees as, as favorable allies, the likes of Japan and South Korea, etc., who have strong chip sectors. The other is to use export restrictions to really try to cut China off from some key technologies uh, in the semiconductor sp space as well. So as you look at China, um, which is already its chip industry, which is already several years behind the leaders at this point as well, is there any chance for them to catch up with the latest technology? No, I think it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for Chinese firms to catch up. They're not just behind in one segment of the supply chain, they're behind in every segment of the supply chain. There's not a single type of semiconductor that can be produced in China that can't be produced in other countries, but there's many parts of the production process, software, machine tools, chemicals that are only produced outside of China. And as you say, there's more and more restrictions on U.S firms, Japanese firms, European firms, their ability to do business with China. So I wouldn't be betting on Chinese firms catching up. And what's more, I think when you talk to Chinese firms, they themselves realize it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for them to produce cutting edge ships. So, so where does that leave China then in terms of its development? Because as we know, a lot of these more advanced chips are underlying the latest developments in technologies like artificial intelligence uh, and, and multiple other areas as well. So when it comes to, to China's development in next generation technologies, a key area of focus uh, for Beijing, does this effectively leave them with inability to, to be able to develop these technologies on a large scale and an advanced scale? Well, it certainly is bad news for China's AI industry. Today, if you look at advanced AI systems trained in China, almost all of them are trained in data centers that use chips from NVIDIA, a US firm whose sales to China have now been restricted by US regulations. But Beijing has pivoted. Now it's pouring money into the manufacturing of less advanced chips. And if you look at the subsidies going from Chinese government to uh, these producers of mature technologies and semiconductors, what you find is that China's spending tens of billions of dollars a year trying to build out capacity. And over the next couple of years, there will be enormous supply coming online as heavily subsidized Chinese firms open up new factories in this mature technology. Hi, I'm Giovanna Bersacci and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.